bottled up. Paul dealt with his loss by bottling. It wasn't exactly an addiction, because it had a good outcome, but it was a form of self-inflicted pain. At least I don't have to worry about tripping over the dog. He focused his thoughts on filling the bottles, plunging the corks, sealing the capsules, and affixing labels with Sheila, working in silence, Paul centering his mind in the monotonous, repetitive task as a form of meditation. Would you mind changing the label? Sheila asked. It was the same design he developed ten years earlier, fine for a garagiste, not for a boutique winery with great wine. Look at Carrie Ann's labels. They're professional. Okay, okay, don't get irritated about it. Let's continue bottling without labels, and we'll add labels later. Yeah, it's better to make new labels. The wine in that batch remain unlabeled. Sometimes the best wine was in unmarked bottles. I was always glad to receive wine from Paul, especially when I wasn't sure what was inside. Although it's not fair to what's on the inside. Books are judged by their covers, people by their clothes, and wine by its package, the label, the bottle, the cork, and the price. People believe higher-priced wines taste better, or will say they taste better. A way to increase the perceived value of a wine is to adorn it with an attractive label, heavy bottle, and jack up the price. A bottle with extra weight isn't the most environmental friendly when it comes to carbon footprint. But San Diego's winemakers, whose customers were mostly local then, weren't concerned about the extra expense, extra fuel, and extra CO2 emissions shipping heavier bottles cross-country. A thick bottle speaks quality, as does a well-designed label. But corks were a can of worms. Australian winemakers proved screw caps prevent wine better, actually preserve wine better than cork, eliminating cork taint or wine ruin by a faulty cork. Yet most Europeans and American connoisseurs were in love with their natural corks. Efforts to persuade consumers that good wine could be concealed beneath a screw cap were ongoing. It was said without a cork, the ceremony of removing it was lost. Yet anyone who saw Jenny Carrie Ann or Jenny Lee unscrew the cap, marshalling all of their feminine charms, would dismiss those claims. Among cork purists, there were different levels and grades. I'm surprised no one has yet marketed bottled with cork from single tree. Along the lines of single barrel scotch, where a bottle's cork is sort of flyably made from one specific grandfather tree in Portugal. Joe the wino mentioned he was looking into it, but he's since gone the way of the screw cap. Cork producers have urged, have argued that cork farming is sustainable with a lower carbon footprint than wine stoppers made of plastic. And corks are biodegradable, unlike screw tops. Of course, Carrie Ann imprinted her signature cougar tattoo on her priceless corks, while Paul used Bluey's caricature on his. Hidden Hills Garagist used a desktop enomatic bottling machine made in Italy, still a queen of fashion, winemaking equipment, and terrific wines which uses a vacuum chamber to gently levitate wine from the barrel through a tube into the bottle without turbulence or injecting significant oxygen. The little enomatic bottler uses the same principle as the large industrial size enomatic wine tasting machines you'll find in some wine bars, allowing customers to taste one ounce servings from different bottles at different price points. All vacuum fresh, the pour is as tasty from the bottom of the bottle as from the top. The first time Paul experienced an enomatic dispenser was at Escondido's Holiday Wine Cellar, the first retailer to order several cases of their 2008 Merlotage and pay in 30 days with a check that didn't bounce. Paul and Sheila celebrated their auspicious beginning in wine sales by purchasing a tasting card they inserted into the enomatic dispenser that deducted the cost of each mini pour, allowing them to experience expensive wines they couldn't afford. They put the card away until the depths of the Great Recession, when, having only five dollars in their bank account, Paul took Sheila out on their wedding anniversary to Holiday Wine Cellar, used the last of the prepaid card to taste Napa's finest cabs, Spain's finest Riojas, and Oregon's finest Pinots. After their fill of wine, they walked next door to McDonald's, 
ordered two hamburgers for 99 cents and a small order of fries they shared. Mac Cafes had started rolling out, and with his last dollar, Paul ordered espresso, which the untrained employee had no idea how to make. The manager stepped in to assist and asked, what flavor would you like with that? No flavors, please, just espresso. The manager and employee huddled for a minute, collected 99 cents, and ran the machine, filling Paul's eight ounce cup to the rim with piping hot espresso. Paul and Sheila felt like they won the jackpot. An evening of the world's finest wines, paired with 100% all beef patties, the world's best pommes frites, and an espresso that couldn't be beat for under $5, the best cheap date ever. Carrie Ann calculated it takes 60 seconds or less to fill a bottle, and since there are 60 gallons of wine in a barrel, that's 300 bottles, which would take 300 minutes. While a bottle was filling, she could cork two bottles already filled. Her bottleneck was the fill rate. She knew she didn't want the small machine to go much faster because she didn't want to inject too much oxygen into the wine. She figured five hours isn't so bad, about the time it takes to drive from San Antonio to Dallas with brakes. So she set Pandora to the Willie Nelson station and started at 9 a.m. When she was finished, she figured she could have driven to Kansas City. Where did her calculation go wrong? First, it took, took her an hour to set everything up and another hour to clean when finished, two hours right there. The bottling itself went smoothly enough, especially when Steph came over to help. Of course, sampling the wine as they bottled slowed them down. Then when they finished filling bottles, they had an empty barrel to deal with. She had a small pump to transfer wine from her 78 gallon flex tank, and as she pumped, a few grape seeds and skins were sucked into the tube, passed through the filter, and crashed the pump's diaphragm. What to do now? Fearing the barrel must be filled at all costs immediately, she and Steph took buckets, sterilized them, and scooped bucketfuls of new wine from the storage tank, funneling them into the barrel. That worked until they got to the tank's bottom and realized the sludge and dregs had been stirred and were swirling around the new wine like cream in coffee. She was attempting to rack the new clear wine from the tank, leaving behind the sediment, lees, at the bottom. Instead, she ended up with a good chunk of sediment in her barrel. She called Paul for advice. He laughed and said, oh, same thing happened to me first time I tried racking, except I used a siphon hose and ended up bucketing. The good news is, there's this French winemaking technique called batonnage, where the winemaker stirs the lees at the bottom of the wine with a stick. You've accomplished the same thing. The wine will be fun. In fact, it'll taste better. Just be sure to rack it again, use a filter, or bottle carefully. Paul stopped reusing barrels. After he used one so many times, it became contaminated. And years later, came to realize new barrels resulted in heavily oaked wines that disguised the wonderful, natural flavors of their wine. So he tried a Goldilocks method, reusing some barrels and blending it, blending it to get it just right. Winemaking is art. Since Paul was lazy, he wouldn't rack wine once it was in the barrel, claiming, wine shouldn't be disturbed once it's put to bed, or he'd say, you increase the chance of spoilage every time wine is removed from the womb, best to keep the baby inside until birth. There was logic in that, especially since it saved him from the task of racking. He didn't filter his wine either, claiming, from the marketing point of view, unfiltered wine tastes better. Why would I want to filter out taste? Giving him an excuse not to filter, because he was lazy. Carrie Ann, the scientist, on the other hand, studied various filtration techniques and asked Lum how to create a low cost and effective do it yourself filter. She published on her blog and made into a YouTube video with over half a million views. Eventually, she ended up producing wines clear as a Rocky Mountain stream. Bottling was as much fun for Paul as spraying. It wasn't. And if the answer to spraying was to hire the spray guys, 
the answer to bottling was to hire a couple of friends and create a mini production line and get it done. He did, and bottling a barrel at a time became quite manageable, which is fine for a garagiste, but not a larger winery. Joe the Wino's solution for bottling was to hire a bottling truck with a setup fee of $2,000, to which Carrie and Paul replied in unison, fuck that, because of the cost. Still, the truck could bottle, label, and box 10 barrels of wine in less time the amateurs could bottle one. And within 10 years, Carrie Ann would be hiring a bottling truck with a $900 setup fee, and she'd get 10 barrels done in time for a wine lunch for all the volunteers. And she'd get the labels on straight, while Paul's were crooked. He told visitors to their community tasting room, it's hard for a dog to place labels on straight, to which female customers said, aww, and pur purchased several bottles on the spot. Those days, it cost Hidden Hills Garage East about $5 to make a bottle of wine. The cost broke down something like this, assuming $300 or 300 bottles per barrel. $1,000 to purchase 1,000 pounds of grapes, or $3.33 per bottle. $500 for a barrel, which could be used three years, or 55 cents per bottle. $1 for a bottle, cork, and capsule, 50 cents for a label. Total cost, $5.38 per bottle. Even when growing their own grapes for each thousand pounds harvested, a small vineyard might spend $350 uh, for spraying, $300 for water, plus other expenses for labor and picking. If the costs were under a dollar per pound, for the farmer growing her own, she might spend more on a better package or a better cork. It's hard to understand how two buck chuck was two dollars a bottle at Trader Joe's. There's one important expense the calculation above is missing, the winemaker's labor. In the end, they needed to be compensated for that, for that along with other expenses, including promotional giveaways, bottles for tastings, tasting room staff, all the expenses of running a business. You can see why boutique wineries charge $25 a bottle or more to cover their cost, plus a little extra for their time. For sure, they couldn't make it up with volume. They had to make it up with quality. When Carrie Ann started making good wine that cost $5, she was saving her retirement kitty $50 a day or, or more, not consuming the Napa wine to which she grew accustomed after college. And while Carrie Ann's savings accumulated, plus growing revenues from her Cougar wine club, her success inspired Paul to contact the local major market, Trader Joe's, Jimbo's, Whole Foods, wine bars, and restaurants to schedule appointments with buyers. Could he sell it soon enough to create space for next year's harvest and reduce the winery's mounting debt?